Monday, November 23rd, welcome aboard another episode of Let There Be Talk, Dell Razors. The candles are lit right here on this uh, sunny, sunny Monday. I uh, can't thank you enough for tuning in, getting ready here for the uh, Thanksgiving. Are you guys ready for that lockdown Thanksgiving style? Here we are, back into uh, lockdown number two out of a four-part mini-series, I'm sure. Four-part mini-series, not too many. It's been, uh, what, about nine months or so, so this is definitely a, a marathon of lunacy out there, and I'm just trying to stay positive, and I hope this podcast helps you a little bit, and also my second podcast, the new one, The Grail with Dean Del Rey, where I'm featuring all the uh, handmade episodes all under one platform. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad you're safe. I assume you are alive and safe. If you're listening to this episode today, you're definitely not dead. It is a wild ride out there for sure. I'm just trying to stay positive got a great guest today. I don't know if you watched Saturday Night Live uh, this past Saturday, but it was a repeat of the one that happened about three weeks ago, the one that the great Bill Burr hosted. And at the last minute, Jack White was added as the musical guest because this uh, country star had gone to a party and potentially might have had COVID. So uh, they didn't let him perform. They got Jack White into the mix secretly, and bam, he comes on, and he's got a three-piece band, and right away, the Instagram and Twitter were lighting up about the drummer. That drummer is Daru Jones, and he is my guest today, and what a fantastic guest uh, he was a few days ago talking to him. Amazing drummer, amazing human, living out in Nashville. Big, big roots in uh, the music scene with him, starting as a, uh, a gospel drummer in the church scene, working his way up into the New York hip hop world and uh, finding his way into Jack White's band. Very organic. And I, 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 I know you're going to love this episode. Another great drummer on Let There Be Talk. I should count one day how many drummers I've had. There's definitely more drummers on this show than anything else. I love me a great drummer, and this guy is in that category. Great drummer. Before I go any further, I want to uh, give you guys a heads up. Got a new sponsor, and this one's great for these COVID times. Skylight. All right? Skylight. You got to check this out. The holidays are just around the corner and you're looking for a way to stay connected with loved ones during the holidays. I've got you sorted. All right. This is the perfect gift. Skylight. I'm not able to visit my mom uh, during this COVID situation. You know, Uh, she's older. I don't want anything to happen. I don't want her to get sick, which is why I love Skylight Frames. It's a touchscreen photo frame you can email photos to and they appear in seconds so your loved ones can see what you're up to and feel less lonely. This is very important, man. This is very cool. What a great gift. For a really special gift for a really special person in your life, you've got to check out the Skylight Frame. Skylight Frame is a photo frame you can update instantly by email from anywhere. A great way to feel close to those you love, even when you're separated. It sets up effortlessly in under 60 seconds. Just plug in, use the touch screen to connect to your wireless network and enjoy. Send photos to Skylight is effortless. Everyone in the family can just email them to your personal Skylight email address and they'll pop up right onto the frame instantly in seconds. Multiple people can send photos to the frame, so it's great way to keep large networks of friends and families in touch this thing is fantastic i'm telling you guys so cool 
It has a black frame and white mat, so it looks like a real photo frame that adds a beautiful touch to your home. Skylight frame has a gorgeous 10-inch touchscreen. You can swipe through photos with your finger and even tap to thank the person who sent it. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. If you don't love Skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. You hear that? Full refund. You can preload it with your favorite photos for a personalized gift. Import pictures of you and your significant other. You know, maybe they didn't even know you had a a significant other. Surprise them with that photo. It's so simple that even my mom, the non-techie savvy mom she is, could set it up in seconds. Here is the offer, all right? And please use this. It's a great gift. It helps the show. It helps you guys sharing your, uh, your family photos during this COVID time. The offer is you get $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the code Delray, D-E-L-R-A-Y. That's right. $10 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame. Just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code Delray. That's Skylight, S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T. F-R-A-M-E dot com. Skylightframe.com. Promo is Delray. D-E-L-R-A-Y. That's right now. $10 off. Get on this. $10 off, man. It's super cool. You just shoot some photos to it, and then your mom or your your grandmother or maybe your your wife or something, maybe you're working uh, remotely. And you want to send your wife and kids some photos or whatever? This thing is very, very cool. Thank you, Skylight, for uh, being a new sponsor of Let There Be Talk. Also, before I do bring on Daru, I want to thank all the new Patreoners. I've got a patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey, and I've got 95 bonus episodes And I do a Zoom Fest every week where you can hang out with me and all the other Dell Razors. And we just shoot the shit about music, records, films, uh, anything you want to talk about. And that is uh, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Let's welcome the new Patreoners right now. Jared, Jared upped his pledge. Thank you. Steve Gregory, incredible, up in his pledge. Bo Fitch is in the house. Ron is rocking here. Ron, one name, Ron. Christopher Blumberg, Brian Marks, Dave Gilgrass, Ron States, Brandon Belt, William Richardson, Mike James, Robert Zaragoza. There he goes. Robert Zaragoza right there. Gary Carpin, Jared, Jesse, Brian Hoffman, John Lopez, Brad James, Zach W., Philip Morales, Mitch Johnson, Joe Rin, Rafael Fuentes, Jordan Taylor Hernandez, Andrew Adlin, and Richard Sakassin. All right, I love all you guys. And if you did pre order a shirt, we're about to print them. If you haven't, you can uh, DM me on my Instagram or uh, Twitter. And I'll tell you how to buy a pre-order hoodie or sweatshirt Dean Del Rey merch. All right, here we go. Thank you, guys. Long-winded intro, but uh, well worth it. The great Daru Jones, drum master. Keep the candles lit. All right, here we are. Another episode of Let the Be Talk and another fantastic drummer. Introduce yourself, my man. Hey, my name is Daru Jones. Um, I play drums. <laughs> you're coming off. You're coming off your uh, your incredible performance with Jack White on SNL a few weeks ago. Man, that yeah, I think you stole the show, man. Oh, I don't want to say that. It was <laughs> it was it was it was definitely a group effort, a band effort. You know, what I'm saying I'm a team player. But thanks so much for the for you know for the kudos and love. It you definitely know. it definitely was fire. I just. I just like when a, a drummer really gets showcased. I've I've had uh, I've done 550 episodes on here, and I've interviewed probably more drummers than any other musician on this show. Because I always wow. say, "Show me a good band, and I'll show you a good drummer." You know? 
hey, we the back, we we the backbone, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes we get disrespected, but you know, I always tell people the drummer can either make or break the gig. You, you can have a good other musicians, but if the drummer's dragging or not on point, then that's the that's you know what I'm saying? You may not be no good. <laughs> 100. But I've never <laughs> seen I've never seen a great band with a shitty drummer. I've never seen it. Mm. Have you? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm but talking you, a, I'm talking a great band. There's a lot of bands out there working and they might have some hit songs or something, but I'm talking about the classics, you know? Yeah, the, you know, not to cut you off. So there, I, I would say there's levels, you know what I'm saying? Because like, as, as, as you know, when you think of genres, you have like your punk rock, rock and roll, you know what I'm saying? So depends on the style because some, sometimes the different genres and, and the layers of it, they, they might require for them not to be as um, precise, if that makes any sense. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I had I had Phil Rudd on from ACDC last week. Okay, okay. And I called him the greatest drummer ever. And 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 of course people are gonna come at me. I get mm. it. <laughs> Look, I love Bonzo. Ooh. And Bonzo yes. is a god to me. He's I think Bonzo all around, but mm. I'm talking about if you wanted a guy to come in and you're playing rock and roll mm -hmm. and you just want that feel and mm -hmm. straight swing and locked feeling yes. phil rudd's my guy you know Ooh, yes sir yes sir yeah but then, but then i'll 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 go straight up like uh like you know like a josh freeze uh, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm into some craziness or you or uh, franklin who plays with kravitz Guys, mm -hmm. you know, I think true great drummers are great, but they also have a showmanship. And mm. right away when I saw you, I was like, oh, I want to know more about this guy. And that is very rare in the drum world. Usually they're in the back. They're hidden. Sometimes a stupid case around them. <laughs> Plex plexiglass, plexiglass. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. <laughs> So let's get into this a little bit. I don't want to, uh, I, I usually don't ask the hacky questions, but I have to ask you this first off, and then we'll get into everything else. The okay. setup, when did you start <laughs> with the tilted forward? And Ooh. does that mess with your joints or anything? Cause you're playing kind of in a weird way. That's a great question. So the inspiration behind a drum kit, I think I started doing it between 2005 and, and 2006 while I was full force. Um, yeah, during that time, I started becoming like the other hip hop drummer in that community. And I remember, um, the Roots was the first live hip hop band that I saw, you know what I'm saying? Played live hip hop and interpreted. And the drummer for that band, obviously, is Amir Questlove. You know, big shout out to Questlove and, and, and the Roots crew for which I've done. And, um, yeah, so in the hip hop community, it's one of the big things that they talk about is being original and being authentic. Similar to other genres, but especially in the hip hop world. So if you were caught, you know what I'm saying, copying, if you had on the same outfit or the same necklace, or you sound like the person, you have problems in the hip hop world. So that stuck with me. So basically, it wasn't too many hip hop groups at that time. I think the Roots was probably one of the only ones that um, were making live hip hop albums, you know what I'm saying, from a live band perspective. And basically, I downsized my kit. You know, I went from playing the, the regular five piece kit, you know, with the snare, two, two racks in the floor. And when I started becoming a hip hop drummer, I was working with um, a group by the name of Slum Village out of Detroit, Michigan. And the producer name is JD, Jay Dilla, rest in peace. And J Jay Dilla, he was known for the way that he he, he, um, he produced his drums. He would, it would, they were very glitchy and drunken. You know what I'm saying? That was his thing. And yeah, so basically to make a long story short, the setup inspiration was basically because I didn't want to be I didn't want my drum kit to look like Questlove's drum kit because <laughs> he he just basically had a snare drum in the full time, which I thought was very unique because he was get, he was so funky he didn't even, he didn't need all these extra you know melodic sounds and I was like okay cool playing hip hop music the type of hip hop that I was playing you didn't need a lot of drums so just bare bones all I need was a snare floor time you know what I'm saying to play with the guys and you know basically I just didn't want to look I just didn't want my kid to look like Questlove kit so I just one day because um. I play traditional, which is it's the grip where you hold right. stick like I this. Right, yep. 
Yeah, but it's like the marching band and shout out to Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich. You know what I'm saying? I saw those guys do it. And I had some older mentors that was doing it too. And I learned how to do it at church. And it was easy because I had the snare drum tilted front. And then one day when I woke up, I was like, man, what happened if I do the floor time? And I just, I, it was all for looks. You know, it wasn't no type of right. scientific reason that I did it. And then I, I sit really high, so I like to dominate the drum and come down. Everything is kind of neatly set up, you know what I'm saying? So that was that was that was my first rendition of that kit. And then eventually, when I started working with Jack White, he's a drummer, and some of those Rack on Tour records they had a marching bear snare drum. Yeah. So I eventually added another snare drum and, and also the, the time, but that, they still were tilted but angled, you know, in, in my fashion. And then um, I'm the type of person where when everybody starts catching on, I like to switch it up. So within my last Two years, I changed my configuration. Still the tilt, you know what I'm saying? But now I'm putting my floor time. All my drums are on this side of the other drum set now. Versus it being on this side. So it was just to switch it up, man, just to keep, keep, it, keep it fresh. And like I said, when people start, you know, copying or being inspired, I was like, I got to switch it up. But yeah, that, that's the whole vibe. Just to be different. Just, just to, just, just to, um, just to have a, a unique look and voice. Because I always tell people like, I came up at a time where, you know, when I got introduced to modern drum magazines, the drum set was your identity. You know, when, when they had the, the drummers at the profile, like Benny Caliuta and, you know, Gad, and they all had the, the setups and, and whatever it was that made them special. And I was like, I knew at some point I wanted to develop that. So that was pretty much the divide. Yep. Yep. How great is Vinny, man? I had him on the show. The guy's played on like 10 million records and, and just a, a damn legend, man. Oh my God, it's 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 so surreal because actually Vinny is a good friend of mine, which I've actually as a kid, you know what I'm saying, as a young teenager, I idolized Vinny. You know what I'm saying? I I got exposed to him watching the Buddy Rich Memorial series. And it basically was like it was four volumes that they put out at the time. And they basically played, I don't know if these were compositions of Buddy Richards, but it was just the band that he used. And they, you know, th this particular volume showcased Vinny Kyle, you and Steve got a day Weckle. And my head was cracked, you know what I'm saying? I, I instantly became a Vinny fan, and I wanted every record that he wore, he, he was on. Yeah. So eventually I would find out about other genres, and like, you know, the rock and roll. And yeah, Vinny was one of my biggest inspirations when I started going from playing gospel music to fusion. And yeah, Vinny, I don't know, I forgot how Vinny found out about me. I might have been this drum tech, which is a good friend of ours. Um, I think he showed Vinny some clips of mine, and I met Vinny at, at NAMM, and he knew me. He already knew who I was. Um, and I think we had a mutual friend too, Tao Wickerfield that plays. I know, bass. yeah, 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 Tao. Because I started working with Tao, and you know, they were all fans, and I couldn't believe it. And then Vinny was like, Whenever you were in LA, I'll pick you up and we go grab food. And he kept his word when I, I the one time I was in LA, he came, he picked me up, and we went to get some Thai food. And it was so real just to sit down and, and ask some questions about the days of Frank Zappa. And, just his career and, and the stories that he gave me was just like, oh my God. But he just, what Vinny was saying to me, he was like, man, you remind me how when we came up, everybody had their own identity or they was, you know, trying to build their own brand. But he was just saying like everybody nowadays, everybody sounds like it's just all these chops, but you know, not really always done in the correct context. So just to get that head nod from Vinny, that like, that was like, that's like a dream and, and I'm, I'm humble. So shout out to brother Vinny, still doing his thing, still crushing. You know what I'm saying? Much love and yep. It's 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 interesting that you say that. I think that YouTube has a lot of um, uh, good things for people to learn, but they also forget about getting an identity and they study chops and you know I want to be Bozy, oh yo, you know, and they forget <laughs> to be their self. So when somebody is say you immediately you're going to get traction. And then if you're good, it's, it's the doors are just flying open because you're like, wow, look at this guy. It's exciting to watch. And then third, if you're a good human to be around, then everyone wants you in the studio on tour, everything. So it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a, it's a package that has to come. And these, some people, they, you know, they just don't have it from sitting home at YouTube and learning they don't learn people skills they don't learn what it's like to be out sound checking and roughing it and all that they just got chops and that's it and and tons of views 
Yeah, you hit it right on the nose. It's a package. It's a package nowadays. And you and you look at the guys that are maintaining during these times because a lot of us are not working, you know, because of the, the pandemic. Um, the guys that are getting the gigs are like like you said, the people that have pleasant energy and good energy because people they want to know if we're going to be out on a tour bus, if you're going to be moody or if we can get along. So it's it's it's, it's what I've learned is it's the full package. You know, if you give all good energy to the universe, you're going to be, receive that back. You know what I'm saying? And, and you spot on as far as like, you know, when I when I was a kid, I did things that kids do. You know, when you see Super Superman on TV, if that's your favorite person, you're gonna want to get a cake and look just like him. You know what I'm saying? But when you grow up and you start becoming into adulthood, and you start paying your own bills. That's when you're supposed to grow up, and you should try to you know at least learn some responsibility. You know what I'm saying? So for me, you know, when I was younger, I was inspired by the legends. I, I went and set up my drum kits like them, and I, I but at, at some point. I knew that I wanted to come into my own, and I'm thankful that I'm getting somewhere. You know what I'm saying? It still, it still take it still took time, but basically, um, I want to say like my style is it's a mix of all of my inspirations, a tidbit from them, with my own, of course. And I came up in the church, and I think that is something that I've gotten from playing in that community that I don't believe that I could have gotten anywhere else. Because when you play in a church setting, you learn how to play and get in the spirit. You play from your heart and soul because it's all about like using your instrument as a vessel to praise, you know, to, to praise the creator, you know what I'm saying? So that right there trickled into my spirit. So with any, any genre that I play in, that's my connection with the audience, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's very important how we live or well, the things that we do before we get on stage, because you got to understand it's an energy transfer, right? So if, if you're going into a gig and, 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 and you tore down, that's energy that you're going to transfer to the offer to the audience, a tore down energy. You know what I'm saying? But if, if you go in there, I'm not saying you got to be all cheesy and every, it's, it's all about balance, you know, because some days we have our days where we just, we need to, you know, do whatever we got to do just to feel good. And that's fine. But just for the most part, depends on what you want to do. And if you want to maintain, it's all about the attitude and respecting your elders, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and learn, learn how to adapt to the environment. Also being a team player, because um, it's not about us. And a lot of, a lot, a lot of, like what you're saying, as far as the guys that just go on YouTube and they just want to, and it's not, it's not wrong with that, because if that's what you want to do, right? by all means. But for, for you know, for what I want to do, you know, I, I definitely want to make records. You know, I want them to be able to, you know, when you hear them Phil Collins records, they're classics. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. the fields are very simple and anybody can do it. You know, so I wanted to, that's the type of drummer that I wanted to do. But yeah, you you, you got it right. Like, I think I came up at a good time, like getting exposed to the VHS tapes, like the DCI videos that came out. And it was all about transcribing. We didn't, we couldn't see it all the time. We had to listen and figure out what they were doing. And I think that really gave me an advantage because it just, it just made me, you know, be able to learn how to adapt. Because when you're on the gig, you're doing that in real time. You know what I'm saying? There's no YouTube to help you. <laughs> And every 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 environment and every gig is, is going to be a different energy and different experience. So I didn't mean to get along with it with that one, but yeah. No, it's all good. Yeah. Let's dig in a little bit. You, um, where do you grow up, and how do you start the drums? Do you want to play drums right out of the gate? Who are your guys? All this type of stuff. Okay, so I grew up north. You know, what I'm saying I grew up in Michigan, um, outside of Detroit, and um, I definitely worked in all of the cities in in Michigan. But yeah. I grew up there and my mom and dad, they're both organ players. You know, oh, so I started B3s? B3s all Ooh. day. <laughs> all oh. day. <laughs> oh, that's my that's my that's my that's my favorite sound on the planet, the B3. Oh and my God. I've had some of the greats on here. And I always say you want a rock band to go to the next level, you get that B3 in there. Say the Black Crows, say Bruce Ooh. Springsteen say uh you know i just had this guy on neil francis man this guy's mm. a killer out of chicago wow. young wow. kid mm -hmm. but the b3 lays down this blanket of soul like no other instrument there's something about the organ i don't know what it is and i, I that's actually I, I need to find out why did they decide to put organs in churches like that's that's something that i want to i want to put you get them al green records and i, I had the luxury of actually recording at mitch Mitchell studio and I met Al Green's keyboard player, but those sounds, man, it just does something to your soul. Like, and and basically, my mom, 
my dad was my mom's organ teacher. That's how they met. So that's how I got it. But anyway, I started playing at church, you know, and I had a lot of, a lot of um, uncles and cousins. I was four years old. And when I came up in um, Pentecostal, Church of God in Christ, and we had church a lot of nights of the week. And every time I would go to church, I'd see my uncles and cousins playing. Mostly, almost everybody in my family play something or sing or something. So, you know, like the Jacksons, like we were very instrumental. Yeah. And I was like, man, I want to do that. And I, I was so short that they had to sit the school bench out for me to sit on. And then, <laughs> then <laughs> that, that's that's all she wrote. And I just kept, I grew, I grew up with my instrument. Yeah. That's, you know, that was a really cool thing. But yeah, four years old, I started playing. Yep. You think playing in the church um, gave you the master of dynamics, say, in a way of Max Weinberg. He can make a song go from way up to way down and sound like the song's going all over the place. But really, a Springsteen song is just straight ahead, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge. But the way that Max would take it up and down, do you think playing in a church would give you great dynamics uh, early on because you got to play low and then maybe bring it up? Yeah, but there, even in playing in church, there's still levels. You got to still grow because you're thinking drums are a loud instrument. So when you're just starting out, you think everything got to be at 10 dB. You know what I'm saying? But it's not until you start watching the OGs. You know what I'm saying? When you want to, you know, when you when you want to start advancing, and because in, in in a church setting that I went to, they you know the choir would sing right, and then they would have these groups that were that were singing. So each group would have their own drummer. But the drummer that could be diverse and play for the choir, because when you play with the choir, that's a whole different vibe. Because you're playing with a lot of voices, which means the volume, you know what I'm saying? And most of the time, everything is at 10 dB, unless you're playing a ballad. But then when you're playing with some of the groups, they're doing some ballads where you can be dynamic. But I also wanted to be pick back up and mention some of the drummers that I was checking out at the time to continue the question. Two of the drummers I was checking out was um, two drummers from Detroit, Michigan. One named Dana Davis. He played with a group called um, The Winings. Legendary gospel group. You know what I'm saying? They've been around forever. And Dana, one of the things that they talked about Dana, he had an ill pocket. His pocket was crazy. But he also had showmanship, but he just know how to lay it down. You know what I'm saying? And when he when he did some, some, fl some flashy, it made such an impact. You know what I'm saying? So Dana Davis, another, another drummer that we were, we were checking out was um, Michael Williams. He played with a group called Commission with Fred Hammond, they, you know, they're legendary, they're legends in the, in the gospel world. But those are two drummers. And when I came up, there wasn't gospel chops. It was all about playing, you know, pocket, you know what I'm saying? Because the worship music was dance music, which is it's still now, but it sounds more like fusion gospel. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of notes. Yeah. But yeah, those, at the time when I came up, it was that, that more of a pocket type of style. And then, like I said, to answer the, the, the current question, as far as dynamics, you just have to learn, you know, and, and also people two things you can learn from a drummer, what to do and what not to do. And I came out of church where we had a lot of drummers. So if you lack in a certain um, area, they was, you was getting scooted off the seat. You know what I'm saying? Somebody else was waiting. They were waiting. So you had to, you had to just learn. And that only had to happen to me one or two times because are you, are you, you familiar with the movie Whiplash? Oh, love it. Love it. Yo, not, not my tempo. <laughs> that that was serious in church. Like if you were dragging a beat and the vocalist is singing and they and they tell you to do that, you was about to get slid off the drums if the next person was coming on because they did not want that beat dragging. And I, I understand it because everybody's like worshiping, clapping, you know what I'm saying? And if the beat is behind, but now dragging is like in, you know what I'm saying? Like dragging is in. <laughs> dragon is in. <laughs> it is. There's that feel where you think like. He's almost not going to get it. And then right at the last minute, bam, you're like, oh, wow, this is way back there. Yes. So, yeah, it's, 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 still, it's still a technique, you know what I'm saying? Even, even though it's done, you can still hear the clock when it's done right, you know what I'm saying? So I play the, dr the drunken style, but I still have a clock in my, my, my mind. So I think people can still gravitate towards it and still feel that, that, that two and four, if that makes any sense. Well, you definitely, you definitely have feel, and I could really tell on the SNL performance mm. because there, the way that you were really driving, you were the engine, and if the wow. engine was a four-cylinder at some points, and sometimes <laughs> it was an eight-cylinder, you know Ooh. what I mean? But it was always, it was just this thing where you were, it was almost a lead drum. 
not in the way of a Keith Moon, but in a way of like, all right, let's do this, guys. And it was explosive. Jack White is, uh, to me, I think him and Josh Homme are the greatest artists in the last 20 years as far as constantly pushing themselves, seeking out new artistic vibes, not staying in a box. And to watch that, and to come in after the country guy gets canned and, and, and to be able to do it that quick and that chemistry was explosive. Appreciate it. Yeah, it, it was it was actually crazy because it had it was my first time actually. Well, I take that back. I did something for Jack last year when he came up with those pedals. Yeah. Came up with some pedals and um I I was summoned to, to to come with them. And but we just played, we didn't play, we weren't playing four songs. Who's this? It was like a little mixtape. We were playing like a few seconds because it was like it was like a commercial, you know what I'm saying? But this was my first time like rocking with him, like like on a performance like of that in like five years. So, you know, I'm thankful, you know, that we still have the chemistry and and um just to piggyback on the dynamic, I started learning that when I started listening to more jazz. Cause I know the jazz, the fusion jazz, and I was checking out like Chick Careers and Herbie Hancock and yeah. All, all the musicians, musicians in those bands, they have solo projects. So I was listening to um, John Patucci and Tony Woods, all of those guys. But that's when I learned how to do dynamics. And I knew early on as a teenager by being influenced by Steve Gadd that he was a John Rabini drummer. He could play some in any situation and he he, he does overplay. He, he does enough, any act. He has a flair. He has this Steve Gadd swag. And yeah, that's when I learned how to do dynamics. And I started incorporating that into all of the genres that I played, which is powerful because if you think of like, you think about like when you're watching a symphony orchestra, some people, they may not understand it. They may think it's boring, but it's just so dramatic. You know, when it goes low, it, it hits you a certain way. And then when they go loud, it just, it's, so it's, 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 it's very important. I guess for people that, you know, want to go and simulate what I'm doing to be dynamic, because like when you're playing, in the setting where you have the vocalist up front versus rock and roll, because that's different. But other type of genres, more, more than likely, when you're playing a verse, it's good to like back down on the tempo. That way the, the vocalist can be heard. Right. And then when you go back into the chorus, you can bring everything back up to t- 10 dB. It's all about telling the story and making making it a full package, like what you hear on the radio, like in like real compositions, you know what I'm saying? So that's my mentality when I'm when I'm approaching, you know, a live setting or even in the studio. Let's talk about how this goes down. So the guy, the country guy, basically, uh, I don't know his name because I, uh, I'd never heard of him before, but that's, that's one good thing about SNL once in a while, they'll drop people. Uh, I remember years and years ago, they dropped Adele on there and she did that, uh, wow. sidewalks, a, a chasing pavement song. I was like, wow, who is this? Mm-hmm. So once in a while I do discover something and I'm deep into music all the time. So, I don't know who he was, but um, so he gets fired on a Wednesday and then Jack gets a call immediately. And I read because the producer was good friends with uh, Jack. And I thought maybe he was dropping that biscuits, uh, white stripes reissue. I thought, Ooh, maybe he's going to do a surprise white stripes reunion. Um, I know. I know. Yeah. That would have been, been, been tight too. I know the world would have, you know, love that, but I'm, I'm yeah. thankful that I, I got an opportunity. Oh, but this, this, this turned out so, so electric and cool. Uh, because one thing I do like about Jack, he's like, look, man, I'm not going to give you the obvious stuff, which is great. So what happens? Does he get the call? And then he calls you right away and says, Hey, we're going to do three piece. Let's rehearse today. What is the time frame? So the thing is, you never know with Jack because thankfully Jack got a lot of major drummers under his belt. He can call. You got Patrick, Carl yep. Lazar, you know what I'm saying? And he's a drummer too. So, you know, you never, you don't, you don't know who's going to get the email or call. But something was just different about this, the way that he reached out because, you know, we normally, you know, that Jack, we text each other, he, you know, randomly. But I was on my way to Planet Fitness because in Nashville, the gyms are open. I was on my way to the gym and um, literally, I was planning, getting ready for my, my online show that I'm doing with DW um, and PDP. I was preparing to get that together for my guests that I had. And as I was going to the gym, I got a text 
about are you are you are you available this afternoon? But he didn't go into detail. Yeah. Through the text, and then the next the next thing I get a I get a, a video call, which was rare. You know, what I'm saying I got a video call, and I was like, he was like, are you somewhere quiet? And I was yeah. like, I'm not right now. I'll, I'll go somewhere quiet. Got went out, got in my car, and we talked, and he told me what was going on, and he asked if I was available. I was like, heck yeah. And the crazy thing, I had plans on going to one of the jam sessions that in Nashville had just opened back up because the pandemic, they shut down a place called Flamingo Club. And it's a place where musicians come and they sign up and you play. And they had just opened it back up. I was like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm excited. I'm going to work out. I'm going to go to this jam. But it's, my plans were, re, were, were uh, changed. And I literally went to his, to rehearse. He was like, well, we need to rehearse ASAP. So he asked if I can come to his home studio. We went to rehearse. But the, the, the tricky part was, he was like, we have to get a COVID test. Right. That's where it got sticky because First, we had to find a place that could do it within the 24 hour because they had to fly us in the day before. So it was Wednesday night, right? So luckily the management, they found a place that we could we can we could we could do 24 hour testing. We did that, but it was like each step. Every time we had to wait for the person to get, to get their results back, right? So we all texted each other when somebody was like, Okay, I test, I test negative. And it was like, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, but, because you, you you know, you could go rehearse. You just came from the gym. You don't know. Exactly. You might have just caught it. And then <laughs> you show up, give it to these two guys, <laughs> yeah. and all of a sudden all three of you are out. <laughs> Yo, so that was that was that made it intense because it's like like you say, if one person would have got it, and Jack don't he don't travel alone. He got a, he got his management and he has the in, the engineer, he's a crew. So we all had to get tested, and we all was like, if if any if any of one of us would have tested positive, who knows what would have happened. So and then we had to take tests every day going into the NBC studios. So those are another chance that we've, you know, being in New York City. And I just stayed in my hotel room. I didn't go out no time. No, that's time I went out, no oh, gamble. Oh, no gamble. Oh, only time I went out was when they had the bandana with everybody. But I was like, man, I because I, I like to move around. I'm, I'm an introvert, but I like to move around, especially when I'm back in New York. I moved to New York, you know, I've been, in, been, been there out of high school and going for years, you know what I'm saying? But just, I know that that's a populated, very populated city. And it's, it was very easy to, you know, to get, so I, I was like, man, I'm not taking no chances. If there's COVID out there, you're going to get it in New York. <laughs> Yo, so, but it, I feel like the Angels was, was, it was meant for us to do that. Like the, the, they flew us on private jets, which was very cool, you know what I'm saying? And it was a beautiful experience, like smooth ride in. We had a couple of bumps, yeah. but the, the, the way out was very smooth and everything just worked out. You know, we got there and I was standing out because Jim Carrey and, you know, Bill, Bill Burr. Burr. Yeah, it was, it was it, bugged out. Bill's like one of my best friends, man. So no it was way. Just, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I tour with him. I'm a comedian and we worked together. I was just with him last night. And wow. uh, uh, I'm not name dropping. I'm just saying that because he is a drummer. And uh, I, heard, I heard, I heard about that. I got to check him out. Yeah. 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 And he plays, uh, we do once a year an ACDC tribute. So I know, mm. I know that once Jack White was on board and you were there, I know he was in heaven to watch you play because he, he, you know, he loves the drums, man. He was geeking out, like literally talked to us for a minute and then come to find out if I'm not mistaken, I think Jim Carrey said that he played drums. So they both were nerding out like, how they just couldn't figure out was with the setup, but it was it was such a cool experience. They were very gracious and very, very it wasn't like you know, you know how it is in our world. People have some status, you know what I'm saying? There's can be this little huffiness, but it wasn't like that. Regardless yeah. of what regardless of what we've all done, we all established in our own right. Yeah. But it was still like we were brothers, like we have been knowing each other for years. I'm thankful. Well, that, those that, guys that, that, are those guys are real people. They're not like, you know, I mean Bill's. Bill's from Boston. He's a, you know, mm. he's, he's a real person. He's not like out there, like I'm famous. Get these fools away from me. <laughs> that, that, that ain't him at all. Now, let me get into this. You get into mm -hmm. rehearsal and how does the medley come around? Does Jack try some different stuff while you guys are in there and then locks in on it? Cause this first song that you guys did the medley mm -hmm. was fantastic, man. Sure. Uh, what, how'd that go down? Yeah. So that's a good question. So basically, when we started rehearsing at Jack's 
Um, I remember us throwing around what songs that we were going to do. And for me, this is one of my specialties, and I feel like this is why people hire me to be like the music director. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a producer. So that means I like to do remixes, and that's what I'm doing when I'm performing live. I'm doing drops like a, like a DJ. So I was already like giving them ideas of adding different things we could do. But Jack, some of those items that we did, those are very last minute. Like we were literally it, it was doing it in real time. Every time we were like, some of the things that we, we that we brought to the table, we, we worked out in Nashville you know, for some ideas that I presented and Jack and Dominic, we would just all work together to try to try to switch some things up. Because when you're playing them records, people, they know what they sound like already. Right. But when you're doing a TV show, you want to add something to it to make a little flair. But like, as far as like, um, originally we were not going to do that Beyonce song because it was, it was going to make the song too long. <laughs> and right. I think that was the longest performed song on SNL. I think we wanted to play like five or six minutes. Yeah. So we we we, we thought that we weren't gonna be able to do that, but it was like, nah, you know, we like we know keep it, keep it like how y'all have it. And then we just um as far as lyrically wise, Jack kept thinking of you know things to, to coincide with what we were living with. You know, in these times, you know, with the COVID and it was a lot of messages in, in what Jack put together. He's a genius. Oh my genius. So it, it was a collaborative effort. Everybody did their part. You know, I don't want to say like, I, you know, we all as a band, that's why I like working with Jack because he's open. He's open. He's not like one of them leaders that because he's a front man, he want to hog all of the, you know what I'm saying? He's a sharing. He's very generous. And he allowed me to have input as well as Dominic. And we came together and, and, and just, you know, and put some, put together all that in real time. And every time we would, because basically when you're doing camera blocking, you gotta keep doing something over and over and over, yep. you know, until they get the cameras and stuff right. So each time we've done it over, we were just thinking of ways to make it better. And 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 when show it's something about when showtime for me, I I, I turn into another person, but um I'm always about the lights camera action. But it just it worked out. It, 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 everything it was just smooth and yeah, that's pretty much the process. We had some things that we worked out prior, but then some of the things didn't get worked out until we were doing the song over and over as far as those, those arrangements. Yep. How did your uh, relationship with Jack White uh, come about? Did you rehearse for his solo band or were you living in Nashville at the time or did you move there once you started working with Jack? How does all this happen? That's a good question. So I was introduced to Jack White through one of the artists that I play with, a, a rapper um, and producer from Detroit, Michigan named Black Milk. You know what I'm saying? And um, as you know, Jack is from Detroit. We all up north, we all from the Midwest, but um, I was playing a um, Black Milk touring band, and I'm trying to remember how Jack got a hold, because basically Jack White, he has a label called Third Man Records, yep. and they had started doing these collaborations with artists. They would do an A and B side, right? And Jack is a huge hip-hop head for people that don't know. Like, we literally playing Wu-Tang Clan, and before we go on stage, we play all the hip-hop classics. Um, but yeah, so there's a track on Black Milk's album called Deadly Metley. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, this is a story that I heard. There was a rock and roll sample, and I think Jack heard it and got excited. We reached out to Black Milk's manager at the time was Hex Murder. Shout out to Hex from Detroit. Um, yeah, Hex Murder. That's the name. yeah, I can love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. Detroit name. Yeah, yeah, Hex Murder, yo. He's a staple in the community, but yeah. So Jack um, team reached out to to Hex, and he inquired about um, Black Milk. And the, the crazy thing was. Jack offered Black Milk to use his natural musicians. And Black Milk could have said, okay, but he didn't. So I'm thankful to Black Milk that he stood a lot of his torn band to have the opportunity with them. We go to Nashville, we go record at Jack's home studio. It, there was two tracks that was cut. Um, and I played on the track called Brain. And the following day, we had a performance at Third Man Records. Which, have you been to Third Man Records? I love it. I love it. Both of them, Nashville and the Detroit one. Yo, so you, when you go to Third Man Records, it's an experience. They have the green, blue screen. I love it. Where you can perform, and it's it, and basically doing that performance, I made an impression on Jack. I never forget we was playing in the set. This song called Losing Out, and I have this drum solo in. I knew Jack was a drummer, but you know, I ain't really, I'm the type of person sometimes when I know people, I don't really, you know, Go all crazy on the, you know, like the start. But my girlfriend at the time, she was like, "Yo, do you know who you're about to work with?" Because yeah. I knew the, I knew the Seven Nation record, but I still didn't put two and two together. 
But then um, after the end of that, you lose an drum solo, I just hear somebody go, yeah. And, and um, Black Whip's DJ, Bill Sharp, he was like, yeah, that was Jack. He was, he was bugging out. Obviously, I did something cool. I go back to New York. And then two months later, I get an email from Jack's team that Jack was now collaborating with RZA, who's a producer from a um, hip-hop group called Wu-Tang Clan. Yeah, I love it. One of my favorite hip hop groups, you know what I'm saying? 93, met the man and he said, um, he, he said for me, he was like, I'm doing a collaboration for, with RZA. I want you to come play drums. And they flew me, they flew me to Nashville. We got to the studio, the day of the session, RZA canceled. Oh. <laughs> canceled. <laughs> so yeah. Yo, I, 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 my heart, I was, I was heartbroken. I was like, yo. Thought I was going to get to work with RZA, but it turned out to be a blessing. So Jack felt bad, and he was—he didn't want to send me, me home, back to New York. And then he was like, "Well, I got a few solo songs that I've been working on. Maybe we can try those." And from what I was told, that's what started Jack White's solo career. <laughs> the blood wow! Wow! Basically, basically, what we did was we tracked for two days. We did like four cuts. You know what I'm saying? We did two one day, two the other day, and um, the studio was a combination of some of the members from Rack and Toys. I think it was LJ. And then it was um, Bats Kaplan. And yeah, so we tried for two days. So the rest of 2011 goes by. And I'm thinking in my mind, man, what happened to these? Whatever happened to that music? I'm trying to figure out what was going to happen with this music that I recorded. And then um, at the end of the year, see, during this time, I was booked six months to 12, 12 months in advance. Oh. I was playing with four different artists. I was playing, I was the music director for Tyler Quali, Brooklyn MC from New York. You know, he's huge in that community. Right. Black milk, and these people. This, 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 this is how my bills were being paid. So, like, basically, um, four artists that I was touring with, they all was inquiring about my availability in January at the same time. And then Jack team rushed up to me, and they wanted to know, well, was my availability to six months to a year? I'm like, dang, what's going on? I was like, well, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if I'm gonna, you know, I had a couple of things I was trying to figure out what I was what I was gonna do. Because I had, Talib Kweli had a, um, a new record that just came out, Gutter Rainbows, and they were already routing tour. And so I was trying to figure out if I was going to do that tour, a Black Milk's tour, which is it's a long story. <laughs> but then, but Good then problem I, to have. Yeah, but thank you. But then I told I told Jack's team, I was like, well, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Do you guys have any detail? And then Jack emails me directly. And he was like, those tracks you played on, they're going to be on my first solo album. And I had this, this vision of touring with two bands, everybody that's been involved with the project, and I want you to play in the male band. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, my God. Like, So I had some decisions to make. And when it was all said and done, that's how I got became a part of Jack White's touring band. And eventually I found out that the songs that I played on was going to be on this first solo record, Blunderbuss. So that's how that came about. So do you move to Nashville after this? And uh, how do you like it out there? Yeah, so I ended up moving to Nashville the following tour or after the tour because we did two tours. Well, I did two tours with him. He's put out a total of three solo records and I played on, on all three. But after the Lazarato tour in 2014, ended in 2015. Before 2015, one of the band members, his name is Ike Owens from Mars Volta. So Ike was a good friend of mine. And, and, and so I remember in Nashville, when we would go, um, we would drive together to rehearsals and, and Ike, I think he had, he was getting burned out from Long Beach. He wanted a different scenery. And he was like, man, we should move in. We should move to Nashville. And we should talk to third man and see if they can do like a little soul, you know, like bring some, like a soul thing. So we had these big plans. We had these big plans. Ike moved, finally moved to Nashville. We were still on a tour. And um, I didn't move to Nashville yet, but I was just, you know, figuring I was in, living in, in New York at the time and some things were happening with my current living situation. And we had a mutual friend in Nashville. And while I was on a tour, all the band members, it was like, man, you should come check Nashville out. It's growing. It, it's, you know, a lot of people are moving from, in, from out of town. You could bring something really cool to the scene. So, I, you know, between, I, I like to be very intuitive, you know, with the creator. So I just feel like the things that were happening in, in my life, was a sign that, okay, I, I, it might be time for me to move on. And plus, I wanted to, by me working with Jack White, that was my real first rock and roll situation. And I wanted to, you know, see what else I could do in that world. Also yeah. get, into, get into the country. Because 
one of my goals as a drummer, I want to be um, a genre bending drummer, like Steve Gadd. I want to be able, you know, to be able to play in all these settings. So this was my perfect opportunity. So unfortunately, on the tour, we lost Ike Owens. We were um, touring in Mexico, and I think it was in October. Yeah. And it it was it was it was man, I, that's it was like a bad nightmare. But man, I we had these plans, and when I got a chance to get myself together to move. He had departed. So rest in peace, I can we miss you. And so yeah, when I since I've been in Nashville, I'm gonna be honest, it's not New York. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So That's what really, I'm asking you because I <laughs> I'm looking around like maybe I move one day because I lived in New York for uh the last few years. Now I'm, mm. I'm back in LA. But mm. COVID now, I'm like, well, I can kind of uh, you know, I look at Portland, I look at Austin, I look at Nashville. I got a lot of friends, man. Steve Gorman out there, fantastic drummer, good friend. Wow. Uh, he lives out there. Marcus King, one of my great, great friends, also, who's one of the best musicians I know. And uh the Warren Treaty, all this good stuff out there, friends and everything. So, yeah, how do you like wow. it? Yeah, so it took it, I'm just now between last year, just now really. You know, getting used to it. You know, but the, that first year was really because you know what I thought. I had all these politics working in my way happen, and all the success that I had, and I'm thinking Nashville was going to be a piece of cake, and it was the total opposite. You know, I had to start from ground zero because, like, you got the OGs that's been there already. Yeah, and they're like, you're not coming in and bringing no New York swag down here. Yeah, you know I mean? so, these are our jobs, but, right? But. You know, I want to thank those that did embrace me, like Rich Redman. He's he's embraced me, Kayo and Brandon Newsom. It's a lot of the people, you know. But when I would go to these jam sessions and go places, I still was getting the side eye. Like they, people, I don't know if people felt threatened, but I've literally I wasn't trying to take nobody's job. I just wanted to come add to the scene. Like I knew I had some flavors, and eventually I feel like I started getting. I, started, I, I think what happened was words started getting around. I started getting those country calls. Because yeah. I, I got in the studio with Sturgill Simpson. Oh, I, wow. Did you play with Sturgill? I did. Whoa. I did. On his I last did. record? Well, they didn't, they didn't, and you know, this is, this is going to, this one bug you out. So I tracked with Sturgill Simpson with James Gatson. Wow. Double drums. Wow. We played over an hour and a half just drum breaks. Whoa. Together. Wow. And I don't even know where this stuff is at. Like, I don't even know what they're doing with it. I don't, I don't, they, I don't think they even use it because of the producer. I don't even know. I don't even think that he knew what to do with it. Not who was, this. who was the producer? I don't, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that. Right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> but, yeah, I, yeah. but I wish, I wish I could get a hold of that, those drums because, like, to walk in the room, I couldn't believe that it was gas and he had the wig on, and I'm like, yo, like, I'm a fan, you know what I'm saying? So my drums are set up. He was playing his vibe, and I, we played together. Wow! So like a country it, Grateful Dead, man. Yo, it was it was killing. Wow. Like I, I, I wish I, I would buy them sessions. Like I would buy whoever got. It. I think Vance Powell, he's he's one of Jack's engineer. I think he got a hold of, of of. But yeah, so that I think some of the country guys, I don't know, because you know when you move, you, you new blood on the scene, and every time I move somewhere, I have a work ethic. And it's you know, and I, I like to add to the scene, but sometimes you don't, you don't, you don't get embraced the same. But oh no, I, I, I dude, <laughs> you're, you're you're talking to a guy that understands exactly Ooh. what you're talking about because if you have work ethic and if you have passion, and it's anything I've ever done, selling motorcycles, doing comedy or music. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I played comedy or I played music before I did comedy. But if wow. you come in and you're ready and excited and there's some cobwebs on some people Ooh. and, and you turn the mirror on them and they realize, man, I'm, 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 I'm getting a little lazy. And instead of going, I got to get my shit out. I got to get out of the chair, man. I got to get off the couch and I got to keep driving. Like I always have. They get angry they, and then, and then they don't like you for, for that reason, for, yeah. they don't even know you, you know? Exactly. So another thing too, it's a lot of, a lot of amazing players in Nashville. It's, and it's like, take your number, you know what I'm saying? Cause we all, we all trying to, you know, keep, basically the, the, I feel like the people that had their jobs, they wanted to keep them. And I understand that, but I'll just let, I always want people to know that I just want the fellowship. Like if you need a sub or, you know, I, I, I basically, basically what I have to do, I have to start my own thing. Right. Which what I brought to Nashville, I brought the drumming, 
with, along with the DJ. That was not happening that I know of before I moved there. That's something that I did in New York where I would play drums with the DJ. Yeah. And I, I, I brought that here like four, like four years ago. And I played, you know, I played for a couple events that they have monthly here. Um, so I had to figure, I had to figure it out. Because yeah. I was getting I was getting these opportunities, but then when word got around, it was like the, the you know, the the, the 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 gatekeepers, I don't know. Well, I I I I won't dish, you know, because I understand. But what I like what I did like about Nashville, they do have a drumming community. Wow. You know, they get together. And that, I thought that was really cool, but I'm I'm an introvert. Like I I kind of like to not saying like I'm better than anyone. I just I I like to preserve my energy and I, I like to I don't know I don't like to um, barge like I like to be welcomed or asked. Right, versus. right. Yeah, yeah. You want to be. That's the thing with me. I always feel like that. I want to be part of the community. I want to be uh, accepted, mm -hmm. and uh, that's all you really want in life. You you, you know you want to work hard. You don't want to take anybody's jobs, mm -hmm. and you want to be part of a team. And if you can't be, then you got to create your own world. You don't go away. You don't quit. You don't stop. Yes. You know, the, the only thing that I didn't like, it's like, I came up, the way I came up is you give people a chance. Don't judge a book by its cover, right? So I would go into these settings where some people, they didn't know who I was, but then they would go Google and do their research. Yeah. And then their whole attitude would change. And I'm like, man. Oh yeah, like oh so hey, have, man, oh hey! You know, everybody's <laughs> being opportunists coming around. I'm like, man. So now I had to deal with that part of the the thing. Yeah, you know. But over overall, I would say right now, I, now that I, I think about it, it was it was it was um it was a cool move because it allowed me because being in New York will wear you out. It will. Just if will. you're dope, if you're dope, you I get know. it. You work it all the time. I know. For other hey. people, not for yourself. Right. And I'm I'm a, I'm an artist myself. I want and I feel like Nashville allowed me to be an artist and work on some of my own things as well as expand and get into other genres. So I think I think overall it was it's still it was a good it was a good move. But now I think it might it might be time, you know. To, I'm giving myself one more year. Oh shit! <laughs> and, and, and then and then where would you go? I don't know. I I I I, I, I literally just bought a car because I didn't have a car when I moved to Nashville. Yeah. Being in New York, you didn't need a car. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I had to, I had to do the whole, I had to do the, I had to start from ground zero on that, but I recently got a car, so I'm trying to set myself up from, so a year from now, I'll be able to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. <laughs> I like Memphis, man. You know, a lot of people are skating out of Nashville to go to Memphis, a little cheaper, a little more old school, you know? Mm, that's, a, that's, that's, that's something that's, that's good that you said that because I used to go to Memphis as a kid. They have, um, these church conventions called Church of God in Christ, Kojic. And um, every day, every, when I was a teenager, we would come to Memphis every year during November to go to the Church of God in Christ convention. And I was introduced to Piccadilly's, Shoney's, and all that. But this particular trip that I was on, that I got, I, I grew in love with the city because um, what I've done this past week, I got a chance to really, you know, rub elbows and be in the same room with like, M ball, I mean M um A ball and MJG, legendary um Memphis rappers. You know what I'm saying? They've been around for a minute. And I was in the studio recording with them. You know what wow. I'm saying? And also um Reverend um Charles um Hodge came in, he played organ on Al Green on all those records. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That guy. Yeah, he, oh, that man. that guy. Yeah. And all and the drums from here too, like um shout out to Terrence Clark. Um, Sergeant Carlos Sergeant, um, Bo Mitchell, Mitch Mitchell, everybody just really embraced me. And I feel like, man, I'm, I'm like, okay. And and I, my son actually moved here from PA. Well, wow, really? So, so yeah, yeah. You, you might be alive for there. I mean, so, so we're gonna see. We're gonna see. <laughs> well, I said, I said, if you play music these days, mm -hmm. you have to live in Nashville. All the other ones are kind of gone. New York, you can't, you can't afford that. L.A., there's not really the music scene anymore. And Nashville, everybody has moved out there. No matter what, uh, you got the rival sons out there. You know, rock. You got rock bands. You got country bands. You got uh, pop stars. Everybody's out there, and it's kind of the machine now. It's not just country. We all know that. Yeah, but it's the, the, the machine, I think, still needs to be expanded. And I feel like it was about to really go there, but then the pandemic came. Oh, because yeah. I, I feel like, 
and also the, the, the tornado, the tornado came as well. Oh, the oh, East East Nashville East. tornado, yeah. And I I live in that neighborhood. I'm I, I'm in East Nashville, and I was I was on tour when it happened. I was in the UK with PBLs, but I feel like this year earlier, it was it was the transition was happening because you got a lot of people that were moving to Nashville from LA. Yep. So that means we're implants. So we we looking for those things from the places that we that we came, that, that we came from. Right. So I feel like there was more going to be more soulful and yeah. hip hop. It was about to go down, but then the pandemic happened. So it's definitely getting it. better there. They got good food there now. They've got some it's good crazy. coffee. They got Jack White killing it out there with the music and stuff and the record store and mm. and all that. And uh, and that downtown area is really cool, man. It's popping. It's, it it's, is. It's, it's popping. And East Nashville is gets gets yo. Oh, that's the spot. Yo, although That's they had a to- although they had a tornado, they building some new things, and I'm I'm curious to what those places are going to be. I heard that they were bringing a live nation um, to Nashville, which is crazy. You know wow. what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I yeah, got a bu- I got a buddy out there, Sadler Vade, and I uh, place with Jason Isbell, and mm. uh, yeah, those guys love it out there. I think you just uh, if you're playing music, you got to be in that pocket. You got to if you're if you're panning for gold, you you got to be in the river. You know. Yeah, I, I think for me too. Now that I have my transportation, because Nashville is not like New York. You you do need a car to get around. I think that's why I was a little stifled because I was Ubering, and then you know also I was with somebody too that that did that transportation, but they're not you know they're you know they're not around. So yeah, that's Nashville is a place where you do need a car. So now that I'm I'm getting around, I'm being able to make some moves. And like I said, I'm giving myself another year. We we see. I, it may be for me to be there, but I, I'm gonna. I'm planning to hopefully get a house or something some somewhere. Right, right. So, that's what that's that's my dream now. It's like I don't really care where I live because I can work. I mean, I care where I live because I want to be around uh, good people. I don't want to be around uh, you know in, insane people these days. Uh, totally, um, totally. And that's why I keep this Joshua Tree photo up here because it keeps my brain peaceful. <laughs> That's, that's a good look <laughs> but i definitely care about now that we're not touring all our our every day of our lives like you were and i were mm-hmm. you start to think about well i want to be in something i want to live in something i really like and uh since i'm going to be inside i don't know when covid you know I, I i it's hard to think about when an arena concert could ever happen again right now you got facts Got facts and crazy. I've done I've done a couple of live stream. This is why I was flown to New York because I, I still have my bands and work in New York. And are you familiar with Summer Stage? No, where's that at? Summer Stage happens in Central Park. Oh yeah. Oh, I do know what that is. Yeah, yes. the series. Yeah, I, the I series. forgot the name of it, but yeah, I know exactly what that is, and it's fantastic. Dylan did it. <laughs> so unfortunately, because of the pandemic, they did online. So oh. I had to. They flew me to New York to go into a venue with no people and perform with a band live, you know, live streaming. It was with a um, producer named Pete Rock. He's a huge 90s producer until now. Got a group called Pete Rock and CL Smooth and I'm the music director. So I was thrown off of that. And then also the SNL. That was really like my first like like gig with an audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. What was in there? 50 people? Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong, but it might have been fifty people. And the crazy thing was, the people had to be work for hire. They had paid the people to be there. Right, right, right. So yeah, <laughs> it was, it was cool though. Let's get into your, let's get into DW now. Um, I'm fifty four. I remember forever. It was three, three drums. It was like Gretsch, Ludwig, Sonar, and mm. and and and. Um, What's the other one uh, Dave Lombardo plays? And, and yeah, Yamaha? Yamaha? No, not Yamaha. Oh, Pearl, Pearl, Pearl. Pearl, Pearl yeah, yeah. Pearl. Like people. So and then all of a sudden around the 80s, DW comes out of nowhere <laughs> and really kind of crushes everybody with their quality and their, their finishes, their hardware. And they were really... Out of nowhere, man. I mean, they just got everybody. It was like Bozio, Ooh. Tommy Lee, you know, any of the flashy, big, big drummers, they got them. And 
here they are still to this day, you know? Uh, what got you on that? And what was some of your early drum kits? That's a good question. So, yeah, I remember as a kid when I would go to the to the drum store when I, because my mom, she put me in chart reading lessons to learn how to read, read music. Um, and I'll never forget when I would go check out, that's when I would see the, mag the modern drum magazines and those VHS tapes that were out. And I never forget, um, I don't know if they have one. I think I think they might have had one, but they DW they they used to make these um, like I don't know if they were like warehouse videos, but it talked about the gear and they also showcased the drummers. Oh yeah, I, I remember like, those. I remember those. Yo, I was like, yo, this is the coolest thing ever. And then I was like, the DW is like the Rose Royce of drums. You see, like like you mentioned, they had all the ill finishes. But the only thing that I really like about the, D, the DW at the time, the hardware to me was like right. It was just overkill, but. I was like fascinated and I knew that DW, they they were always on the top top level. You know what I'm saying? Yamaha was like my first, but when I got exposed to DW, I was like, oh my God. So it was actually a dream for me to, to, to play DW. I just, at that time, I just felt like that was just far, you know, like when you're dreaming of getting a million bucks, you feel like that's far fetched, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. it, can, it can happen to you, you know, but I'm thankful that in my career, and I, I endorse other brands, and I feel like the brands that I had during the time, they worked for those settings. But I never forget when I got the opportunity to work with Jack, I was like, I want the best everything. So I'm all about building relationships. I say this, that's the most important thing in this game. Oh, yeah. yeah. Relationships are everything. You know what I'm saying? So I remember going, you know, going to the NAM conventions. Yeah. You, you meet, go to, you know, you go to the booths. You know what I'm saying? You build rapport and. I had um, one of the companies that I was working with, Mono Creators, they make these really cool bags. I know, I love Mono. My, my buddy Randy uh, is one of the head sales guys. There. Yes, yes. So Great stuff. They do the, the guitar bags, the backpacks. Mm -hmm. I, yep. I, I've done, I've toured with a backpack for four years. Wow. Yeah, so I remember when Mono came out, I was one of the first guys, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that came on board, you know, once they, once, so I'm, I'm about being loyal too. So anyway, to make a long story short, one of the guys, um, the original, the, the original um, CEO, his name is Daniel Kushner um, from San Francisco. And he was friends with Scott Danell from DW. And I'll never, I'll never forget when I got the opportunity with Jack White, I couldn't tell everybody. I couldn't tell the companies that I was you know, working with, but I felt like, man, I was like, I told Scott, I was like, man, you can't tell nobody to do this gig with Jack White. You got a gig on SNL. And I was like, man, I'm trying to, who do you think companies, you know, was trying to, we, Brainstorm is like, well, I know this guy's, um, I know one of the people at DW, and he did an email introduction, and Scott checked me out, and that was all she wrote. So wow. that's how I came on board. Wow. And then um, as far as the other companies that I work with, I think what's helped my career was I've always documented, you know what I'm saying? Uploaded that stuff to MySpace, YouTube. So I, I had art, like that was like a resume, you know, that was my resume. All right. You know what I'm saying? I used that to help get endorsements. And I remember back in the days going to PASIC, which is the drummers um, convention they have once a year, taking like, you know, bio, CD, you know, stuff to... Oh, yeah. <laughs> but... Hey man, I'd really like to play your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Trying to get on, <laughs> trying to get on. They're like, ah, uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. so, and sometimes they would throw the stuff away. But anyway, um, I never forget when the internet's really got popular when MySpace and YouTube came around, yeah. I took advantage. I had my little camera, I filmed everything and I uploaded it and that helped me. So when I approached DW, I basically sent them everything I was doing and it, it, it worked out. And then I was like, the symbols that I was using at the time, they were cracking when I was playing rock and roll. So I was like, I gotta upgrade that. So then I noticed all the rock dudes, most of the rock dudes were Pisces symbol guys. Yeah, I, I need to follow suit. So. I was able to get hooked up with um, Andy Shreve, a good friend of mine. He signed me with Peisty. He also signed Vinny as well. And then he got a job at Gretsch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was my introduction to DW as far as the kids that I played on as a kid. When I came up, every church had a Pearl drum kit. Like, <laughs> yeah. export, export series, you know what I'm saying? I was popping. Oh, yeah, export. <laughs> yeah, export. Everybody, everybody, everybody rocks that. You got to have that, man. It's like $7.99 and you're yeah, playing. Yo. Woo. And then um, when, we, when, when we started getting, got some money in the church, they got a Yamaha. Oh, yeah. The Yamahas, they were my favorite. I wanted to play Yamaha. I, well, 
I wanted Yamaha to be my endorsed endorse of company. And um, what I liked about Yamaha was you could move, you know, it wasn't all these, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm with DW now and they changed the hardware, but it was just so easy to just move and adjust. And um, I played Yamaha for years. Yeah. Years. I, 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 didn't, I, I think I tried other kids, but Yamaha was like my thing, but it was, still was a dream of mine to, be, to become a DW because I always carried them on, a, on a, such a high standard. They were, they were, they were innovative. You know what I'm saying? They're like, well, DW had that giant, great run, and then a little, a little boutique company. Matt Cameron starts playing that Ayot or what? You know those Ayot, the Ayots or whatever with the wood rims. Matt oh, Cameron, yeah, 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 Soundgarden. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Next Ooh. thing you know, everybody was playing those. That guy yep. was up there in Vancouver, I think, uh, making those drums. I met him a few years ago at the NAMM show. He's still around, but. Wow. Those were killer drums with the wood hoops and, yes. and, you know, Matt Cameron's playing and Matt Cameron's like, you know, one of these God drummers. And then everybody's mm. like, what are those things he's playing? You know? So, oh my God. Yeah. It's it, drums are, drums are amazing thing, man. It's, um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's not to cut you off. It's a part of you. It's like when this image is everything and you look to find your outfit to put on, that's what drums are supposed to be. The drums are your identity. Yep. So, you know, as drummers, this time, you know, got to keep that in mind. It, it depends on if you want to be that type of drummer to have to, to make up make a name for yourself and have that type of voice. But yeah, it's like it's like fashion. You know what I'm saying? Well, Here. I I know you're you're an eyewear guy like me. Um, I mean, I'm an eyewear freak. I I, I mean, to me, it's the man jewelry, a watch, eyewear. <laughs> A good belt, you know. I need, I need you to give me some of your pieces. Here. You got some. I, I need, shoot, I need, I need to get some of them joints. You, you got, got <laughs> these are great. These are Blake Kuahara, man. Um, he, I had him on the show a few weeks ago. Handma- handmade in Japan. It's a frame inside a frame. So they're what? like, it's two frames. Yeah, look at this. Hold on. Can you see it? Wait. Yeah, I can see. It's, 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 oh, it's, it's tough to see because I got that backdrop. But it's a frame in a frame, man. Ooh, that's dope. Yeah, it's so wild. Cool. What are you rocking uh, there, man? Man, these now these are just work glasses. <laughs> yeah. Just some hey, just but some you, Home Depots. <laughs> yo, but you know what? That's that's what that's what hip hop was all about. Like yeah. taking, making things hip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They was taking a car hike. You know, like the work stuff, and they made it hip. Oh yeah. So I'm all about that. But I I, I think I have a couple couple cool friends. I got the Gucci's and. Yeah. But I, I like I like getting new stuff, so I'm at, I'm I'm had to come in your your closet and see what you got. <laughs> yeah, DM me and I'll send you uh, Jacques Marie Maj and Blake Kuahara and Kubaram oh are three of the most uh, most progressive radical mm. you know frame makers on the planet right now. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you got any any hookups or any divs, holla at your man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we can uh, do a yeah. trade off. I'll I'll, I'll I'll write books and give them to you, and then you. Can, <laughs> <It's paid off. laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's how it works. That's how it works. Barter the barter system. <laughs> Look, man, great to talk to you. Fantastic. You and I'm looking forward to uh hopefully uh seeing you work some more with Jack again and 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 whoever else out there, man. You gotta get somehow you gotta get in Dave Cobb's mix because this guy's making some of the greatest records in Nashville. And you oh get it, God. you get in that room and you're going to be working like a madman. Oh my God. I would love to, like, I, I, I like switching it up and you know, I'm a people person. Like, although I'm introvert, I like people and I'm an image. I mean, I like if, if the vibe is, is right. Let's, let's get it. Let's get it. I'm easy going. And I would love to work with all those guys, whoever think see me in those, in those, in those fits, holler, at, holler, you know, holler at my manager, you know, Dean and, and yeah. get him situated, you know what I'm saying? We get his percentage and, yeah, <laughs> DM me. Hey, maybe maybe we can uh, do a Zoom drum lesson for Bill Burr for Christmas. Oh, that is, I'm with that. That'd be lit. Can you can you do that for me? That'd be crazy. I mean, Bill, I, I'm sure Bill is already dope, and I, I'm I'm late. I got. I'm sure. Like I've heard that he's been getting taught by some people. But yeah, yeah, wants, yeah. But if, it's if, still if, cool. If he, if he wants to learn some swagger, some swagger beats, I got him. That's that's nothing. Let's All right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna set it. this up, man. We'll get that going. That'll be fantastic. But I, I gotta say, yeah. this is rare because I get a lot of requests for um online lessons and I decline. 
Uh, we can't we can't tell nobody. Okay. They gotta see this. Because <laughs> 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 I be because yo, I, I be getting like family members and people that I know, they be like, yo, they be trying to play, play the politic move, but I was like, it's not fair because I do it for one, I gotta do it for the other. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, yeah. we'll make we'll make it we'll make it an exception for Mr. Bird. All right, we'll man. I love you. <laughs> love Give you. everybody <laughs> your uh Instagram and your uh where to find you. Okay, I'm on Instagram, Daru D A R U Jones, Twitter, Facebook, and my website is Rusic Records. That's my independent label. And that's R U S I C Records.com. Yep, I gotta update my site because in October, so much is, a lot of yeah. things have happened. I hadn't had a chance to upload stuff, but yeah, stay tuned. And um, thanks for having me on your on your platform. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, much love. I'm looking forward to crossing paths and getting some food. You know what I'm saying? Kicking it. You know what I'm saying? And just can't wait to see you. Yeah, fellowship, and I appreciate I appreciate it. Hey, well, do me a favor. Uh, when Zany's opens back up there in Nashville, the comedy club. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go down there and give them a little love, watch some comedy, and uh, you know, and uh, support that local comedy scene out there, man. It, you, you will love it. It'll make you laugh, and it'll it'll take you uh, it'll take you somewhere for an evening. Okay, I think I think I went I went there to see Bill Bellamy, but it was Bill Bellum. Yeah. Oh, you went the wrong guy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, have you been? Have you done Zanies in Nashville? I have. Yeah, and I also did the Ryman, I did the rhyming with Bill Burr uh, two years ago for the Nashville Comedy Festival. No, I need to be in that room next time. We, 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 we in the same city. I need to be in that room. I'm gonna get I you. I'm gonna that. get you hooked up, and then also got to hook you up with uh, Allison Mosshart. You ever talked to her? She oh yeah, plays, yeah. Uh, Allison loves me. I love. She's a sweetheart. Yeah, she's great. She's a sweetheart. Oh my god, her paintings are crazy. Oh, they're For great. Our they're great. Oh All my right. God. Yep. Stay strong. Good to have you. Fantastic performance on SNL. Appreciate Thank it. you Appreciate for uh, doing the show. God bless. Thanks for having me on the show. Candles lit, my man. All right. Salute. Thanks, Dean. See you, buddy. I right, see you.